So finally, Martin Heisenberg, who wrote the essay, and I'm going to give you a little more about Heisenberg because his model is actually describing fruit flies, which is his expertise. And even animals, no, not animals, the prokaryotes, the bacteria of the world, who are very important. I've learned recently we have 10 million cells that are our own, with our own DNA in our body. But they are outnumbered 10 to 1. There are 100 trillion bacteria living in our body, many of them doing what you're about to see. And Martin Heisenberg said in Nature that even bacteria have free will. So he got a little slammed for that because it isn't clear you'd like to say they have a will at all. But they have something very much like what William James saw. And I think I tried to show this to you. Basically, Heisenberg says, the little bacterium, which has a little longish body, has got sticking out the back of it a bunch of little hairs or flagella. And there's a motor, like an outboard motor on a motorboat. And when it goes clockwise, all these flagella separate and the bacterium tumbles. OK? However, if he turns the motor the other way, counterclockwise, the little hairs line up, not like a ponytail, but like a braid, Holly says, and the, the bacterium goes forward. So he can do two things. He can tumble randomly, or he can go forward lawfully. And when he goes forward, what does he do? He's the random generated alternative possibilities. The bacterium then moves forward and evaluates the gradients of temperature, nutrients, toxins, what's going along my body. If it looks good, he just decides, and this is what Heisenberg is saying, to continue in that direction. Something good over there. But, but if it doesn't, it tumbles again. That's the entire work of Martin Heisenberg. I've been asked at this conference in Barcelona to explain how you get from prokaryotes with random plus lawful up to human beings and, and really call it free will. And Martin and I have decided to agree to call this not free will, but behavioral freedom, which just says that even the bacteria, their actions have not been determined since the beginning of the universe. They're, in fact, little free agents of a sort. They, they act think, out things that start with randomness. And how it evolves to free will, I'm afraid I, again, don't have too much time for you. If you want, we can come back to these things. I basically see that in biological evolution, the selection process is natural selection. But in uh, the bacterium all the way up to humans, the selection process is not natural selection. It's a teleological selection or really a teleonomic, as Jacques Monod qualifies that term, since teleology has this flavor of a religious original uh, from Aristotle, it has purpose. And the little bacterium decides what to do because it wants to get something good to eat, or maybe whatever. So um, basically, the means of selection is what's different as you move up from animals that have little or no learning capability. You get the ones that can take their experiences, and here we come to James thinking, and remember their experiences. They learn things. Therefore, when those experiences are in their mind, they can use their past experiences to guide their current choices. That's way level above the instinctive only and the kind of what is an instinct lecture of James, the are we automata lecture of James. All talk to these points really beautifully. The selection criteria in the case of someone who can learn or an organism that can learn are acquired through experience including parents teaching us, peers teaching us, and experience and so forth. Whereas the instinctive behaviors all come through our ancestors having learned them and, and, and produced us instinctual. Then I want to add a kind of predictive selection where certain organisms, higher animals, are smart enough to actually anticipate the consequences. And finally, one where we use norms and we think about our rules of our society to make, help us make our decisions. And that'll be the core of my talk uh, at Barcelona. So basically, everything I do here is separate free from will. You've got the message, I hope. Freedom is unpredictable because it is creative and indeterministic generation of alternative possibilities. The will, it's, however, is adequately determined by our reasons, by our character, but not predetermined. And as I say, John Locke had already separated these two in his essay concerning human understanding, the chapter on power, in which he said, it's, I think the question isn't proper whether the will be free, but whether the man be free. OK, to come back to the point that most philosophers thinking about this subject now think about it as a moment in time, a moment divided between a fixed past and the laws of nature, as they like to say, 
and our decision in the future. Given that it's one moment, they can't see what James sees, that we need something happening that generates the possibilities before we make our decision. And so they come to this conclusion with a, a decision that is a single point in time. I say we need time to, and this is a jargon term of the debates, do, other, do otherwise. We can choose to do otherwise. We could have done otherwise, the basis of moral responsibility. But in order to have that, it can't be just one moment, one instant. So in our model, the decision process is temporal, some generating possibilities, then there's a step, then we evaluate our decisions, uh, evaluate our alternatives, make a decision, and move into the future with thoughts that come to us freely and actions that go from us willfully. Now my critics say, hey, Bob, you're still totally determined. Once randomness is given 17 things to choose from, you're going to pick the one that's best for you, according to your character. You're just as determined as you were before. It's amazing how many people have told me that, that I haven't made any progress on this problem. And so here I add to them, wait a minute. We can have what we all know as second thoughts. Just because random possibilities have appeared and we're not thinking about them, and there is one that looks the best, we can say, that's not as good as I wish it could be, provided we have time. And time is of the essence in understanding free will, because it's not a moment. It's a process. And we can say, oh, think again. Go back. Generate some more possibilities. Because if we don't have any time, we go with whatever we got. And that's the way the world is, and it's a practical problem, as, as James would have known. So I agree with Dan Wegner that we're not always free. Much of what we do is because we inherited a tendency, or we got conditioned, uh, we're depraved on account of we were deprived as kids, the famous uh, line on Officer Krupke's song in uh, West Side Story. Lots of reasons which are mitigating circumstances in the courts of law why we weren't responsible. I'm not denying Dan Wagner's research. It's wonderful. The many things he's been able to show, which is why a the agent did something, but they gave a different reason. But I want to say at the bottom line, there's always room to generate possibilities, and that's because there's no single cause-effect chain in the history of the universe. Instead, at all times, we're looking at multiple causes and multiple chains, which I've drawn in as chains. And here, basically, I've got Dan Dennett's, what he calls functional homunculi in the brain, each of which is wanting something to happen, and they argue over what's going on. Nice model. Bernard Bars, the great author of consciousness uh, uh, textbook, where he cites William James' ideas as coming back full bore, people are working on many ideas of James, and I've written to Bars and I've said, and the one, his work on free will is far and away the greatest, and I'm hoping to bring that back. And he and I are debating uh, that a little bit. But anyway, basically, remember that model of past, decision, future? Here's the past. There's the Big Bang of the universe, then the origin of life, Homo sapiens creation. Every one of those events had involved randomness. Then it comes to our birth, our conception, our conception and birth and education and environment can affect us. So we've got heredity as an effect, education, environment as an effect, and these are alternatives according to most thinkers. There isn't anything else in there that we would call free. It's just a big thing going on and we're at the end moment and we have to choose whatever the options are open to us because of our background. But Bob Kane, my friend Bob Kane, has this idea of self-forming actions where sometimes I use a light bulb at some moment, something free happened, and that helped to form our character, he calls it, uh, self-forming action. So what happens now is the mind has a bunch of alternatives to choose from at all times. Some of them are properly determined or by, by factors even before our birth, but others that happen our own free creations during our lifetime. And to fill out my model, I basically want to say that when you're faced with a given circumstance, you don't have to pick one of these you can generate possibilities, according to James, and you can send them over for evaluation, and you can do that until you come to the best thing you can think of, the way Henri Procore talked about how many weeks or months he worked on problems until the run popped into his head that he finally had a great piece of work. Okay?